In our previous class, we saw a very interesting way of making an infinite data structure. Today I'm going to show you a completely new way to do this that's going to turn out to be much more useful for the kinds of problems we want to solve in the next few weeks. To demonstrate this, I'm going to start by doing something rather odd. I'm going to make two very similar but not identical lists. So here's the list L1 and I'm going to make two versions of it. Just to be sure, L1-1 is the list 1, 0, and L1-2 is the list 2, 0. Now, I'm going to do something that might seem even stranger, which is I'm not going to, now going to make two more lists that are just like the first ones, but in a slightly different way. So I'll define L2 base to be cons 0 onto empty, <coughs> and then L2-1 it's going to be cons1 onto L2 base, and L2-2 is going to be cons2 onto L2 base. And remember what L1 and L2 look, L11 and L12 look like. Now when I ask for L21 and L22, they look pretty much identical. Needless to say, if I asked whether these were equal, I would expect to get back the answer true. And similarly, for L1-2 and L2-2. If I run these, Dr. Racket tells me they are essentially the same list. So just to be sure, there we go. Well, that's nice. But there seems to be some way in which they're just kind of different. Now, if consing 1 onto L2 base were to take time linear in the size of L2 base, then it might be unsurprising that the two lists have the same structure, the two lists here being L2-1 and L1-1. But that's not quite what's happening because we did tell you that cons takes a constant amount of time, so it can't really be copying the rest of the list, which suggests that L21 and L22 must actually be sharing L2 base in a way that L11 and L12 are not. So what could we possibly write that might help us distinguish these shared bases from the unshared bases? Well, that's where an operator called eek comes into play. Eek has the same type as equal, but whereas equal looks at the structure of the values, eek looks at the actual locations where they're stored. So if I were to ask whether the rest of L11 is equal to the rest of L12, I'd get back that they are. And similarly, for L21 and L22. But if I were to ask whether they are eek instead, I'm going to get an error. And the error I'm going to get is right here. <clears throat> it's telling me that the rest of L11, which is this part over here, and the rest of L12 are not in fact the same thing in memory. In contrast, the rest of L21 and the rest of L22 are in fact the same thing in memory as these little arrows that Dr. Racket is drawing might help me understand. So if I go back and replace this true with a false, I find that all of these tests pass and this helps us understand the difference between eek and equal. Equal is looking at whether they're structurally the same. Eek is looking at whether they are, in fact, the same objects in memory. Now, eek and equal are obviously very different operations. But it may be a little frustrating that when Dr. Racket prints out these values that are so very different, so different that eek and equal can tell them apart, it prints them out in pretty much exactly the same way. Let's change that. <clears throat> 
So we're going to go to the language menu, the choose language option, and we're going to ask Dr. Rackett to show us the details of the language. And when we do, we'll find that there's a little button there called Show Sharing in Values. Let's turn that on and let's ask Dr. Raggett to execute again. Notice that now it has this little annotation that says custom, meaning we've changed the language a little bit from the default. And to understand how we've changed it, let's just construct a list out of each of these lists. So here's a list containing L1-1 and L1-2, and it's exactly what we'd expect. It's a list of lists of numbers, and it's a list where the first list is 1 and 0, and the second list is 2 and 0. But now when we instead construct L2-1 and L2-2, something funny happens in the output. Dr. Rackett prints this output in a very curious notation. It says it's still of the same type, it's a list of list of numbers, but now it has this funny thing here. It says that this list over here is going to be given the name hash zero. And the name hash zero refers to this list in here, the list consisting of just the number zero. And when it prints the second list, it says that the list that goes in this position here is in fact the same list as the one that was over here. Now these hash zero equals and hash zero hash names aren't globally defined. In fact, they're only defined inside the context of the list that you're looking at. So they are essentially local names constructed by Dr. Rackett that help us understand what the sharing structure is inside the list that we're looking at. Now this notation will take a little while for you to get used to, but it's awfully convenient and it's extremely concise and therefore a nice way to write such lists. Now, that said, you might not want to write these lists in this somewhat cryptic notation, making up numbers for names as you go along. So Dr. Rackett actually gives us a very nice notation called shared, by which we can give more expressive names to these lists. Let me show you that next. To illustrate shared, let's go back to the lazy list we had before. Except this time, they're going to have an interesting wrinkle. Look out. I'll start by giving you the definition of the lazy list, except instead of having a thunk in the rest, we're just going to have a reference to the lazy list itself. Obviously, we need something to help us construct instances of this, and that's where shared is going to come in. Before we get there, it's pretty useful to have little selectors for the first and rest, just like we had before, so I'll give you those as well. Except again, notice that lazy pair doesn't need to invoke a thunk because there is no thunk anywhere in this definition. Okay, now we're ready to actually use shared. As an example, I'm going to create a lazy list that is infinitely long and alternates between the colors white and gray. Imagine, for example, you're building a table on a web page and you want to give each row of the table a different color. Maybe you want to alternate between white and gray, maybe you want red, white, and green, or any other color combination like that. And you don't know up front how many rows you're going to have, so it would be nice to just define the infinite list once and just pull out as many colors from it as you need. That's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to use share to define that list. Here we go. Here's our definition. Shared is a binding form. Think of it a little bit like a let. So this is saying, let W be the lazy pair that is white in the first position and whatever is bound to G in the rest position. G is a lazy pair with gray in the first position and whatever is bound to W in the rest position. So you can see that it looks an awful lot like a let except W is referring to G and G is referring to W and well that's going to be an infinite data structure right there. And finally, a shared has a body just like a let has a body, and in this case we're returning W because we'd like the first color we pick to be white, and the next color to be gray, and the third color to be white, and so on. So colors is now bound to this infinite list, and if we go into Dr. Racket and ask to see it, 
we see that we have a lazy list of symbols where we have a lazy pair whose first value is white, followed by a lazy pair whose first value is gray, and then back to the whole list all over again. So we get white, gray, white, gray, and so on. So if we ask for the lazy first of colors, we get white. If we ask for the rest of it, well, watch what prints out. We get something that's a lazy pair that begins with gray, then white, and then circled, but circles back in on itself again. In other words, we've got the same list just shifted over by one. And if we now ask for the first of that list, well, we get gray. And if we keep traversing down the list, as you can see, we keep alternating in color. Now, I don't want you to think that you can only have the name of an identifier here. You could, for instance, construct a list of both of these colors. And now watch what this is bound to. We get something that's a list of these lazy lists. And the first of these is the list we've seen before, white, gray, and looping back in on itself, except Notice that Dr. Racket has given a name to the second element here. And this is, in fact, the second element of this overall list. So what that tells us is the first list is white, gray, white, gray, white, gray, and so on. And the second list is gray, white, gray, white, gray, white, and so on, just as we would expect because we have W and G over here except all these references here are telling us that we're not actually consuming an infinite amount of memory. We're actually consuming a very, very finite amount of memory, just as much as we can see on the screen. Now, shared is actually very useful to us because it lets us create these infinite objects very conveniently. We no longer have to deal with the thunks. We no longer have to worry about forcing the thunks to get the values back out of them. We get this very convenient notation by which we can describe infinite objects. Now there is a difference between this kind of solution and the one we saw earlier. The one we saw earlier lets us make infinite objects where each element is truly distinct from all the previous elements. For example, when we generated the Fibonacci numbers, all the Fibonacci numbers other than the first two are truly different from each other. In contrast, here we can only loop back on objects we've seen before. So this is an important distinction, and if we actually need to make distinct objects each time, we're going to have to use something like what we saw last class. But for, mo for the most part, we're not going to need to do that in this course. The other thing to note is there's actually a little subtle difference between the lists I showed you earlier today and the lists I'm showing you just now through the use of shared. The ones I showed you earlier today had sharing, but they didn't loop back on themselves they didn't actually contain cycles. And there's actually a name for data structures like that that have sharing but don't have cycles. They're called DAGs, which stands for Directed Acyclic Graphs. DAGs are really useful because they are richer than lists, but they are weaker than graphs that have cycles, which means they have more properties than one, fewer properties than another, and end up occupying a very important, very subtle midpoint in the data structure spectrum of computer science. We don't usually give them much attention, but in this course we'll find that they're pretty useful and we'll return to them a few times, because after all, on the internet, nobody really knows you're a DAG.